this bag of bones. I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. It's just when I ran out of road, I met a man. Welcome to Headwaters at IPFW. It's great to see you here this morning. We're glad you're here. We got uh, we got a lot of things kicked off. We got uh, kids coming on here, and uh, they're going to start us off with a song. As they come on, I'm going to give us a call to worship. Out of the Psalm, Psalm 51. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them that those who love your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. And again, the psalmist says, But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. And again, the psalmist writes, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And again, the psalmist records, Met, But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord.
Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, children. It's great to have you here. Sing that song to kick us off here today. This is the day the Lord has given us. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Why don't you go ahead and get up out of your seats, move around a little bit, give a warm welcome to those around you. Parents, if you have children singing, go out the door and meet them in the hallway.
fun. Hey, thanks for being here today. Uh, welcome. If, you, if this is your first time being at one of our gathered services here, this to me feels uh, much like uh, a few stories in the Bible that have a similar feel to them. Uh, first in Joshua chapter 4, when God brings the nation of Israel into the land, he stops up the Jordan River, very similarly to what he does with the Red Sea. And on their way through the riverbed, Joshua instructs the Israelites to pull out stones, and they stack them up inside the promised land, and he tells them this is so that when your children ask you, you can remind them of God's faithfulness. Samuel does a very similar thing in 1 Samuel chapter 7. There it's slightly different. There's only one really large rock, and he, he names it an Ebenezer. If you've ever sang that in a song on what in the world is this, it's a reference to 1 Samuel chapter 7 and the reminder of God's faithfulness in the life of his people. These gatherings always function in my own thinking in those terms. We gather together as God's people, as the church, being reminded of his faithfulness to us. Thanks for being here. Now, I've been tasked with framing our morning, and I've been given 10 minutes to do it, which is not a good thing for a preacher on a Sunday morning, 10 minutes. That's not good. So I, I just used 90 seconds of it talking about Joshua 4 and 1 Samuel 7. That wasn't even on anything, but here we are. So I have two points in this greatly abbreviated sermon here this morning. 
First, faith in what? And second, motivation for what? This is a church service. I know this isn't a church building, but the church is where God's people are. So we are here. This is a church service. It's a great thing, and we tend to talk about faith a lot, typically in very positive terms. That's not necessarily wrong, but it does open us up to missing something. Faith, in and of itself, is neutral. It's not a positive thing. It's not a negative thing. It's, it's just neutral. The, the positivity or negativity of faith depends on the object in which you have faith. By itself, it's, it's just a neutral thing. It depends on what you've attached it to that makes it a good or a bad. For instance, you can have faith in the Chicago Bears... And some of you do. I lived in Chicago for six years. I listened to that sports talk radio in Chicago, right? This is the year we're winning the Super Bowl. Really? Are you? They had faith, but the object that they placed their faith in made that not a positive, much to their chagrin. It was a very large negative. There's an old metaphor that I always like when thinking about faith of a train car. It's best to go back to like 1800s steam train in, uh, era here. Pick a train car, whatever it is. It's a, it's a passenger car or a cattle car or a gondola, whatever. It doesn't really matter. That train car in and of itself doesn't move very quickly. It's, it's pretty slow. It's, it's really slow doesn't move. It just sits there. It has no power, no ability in and of itself. But once you attach that car to a steam engine, it was the fastest thing in the world. The most powerful thing that had ever been because you had attached it to something greater. That is us, church. We are people of faith but it's not an abstract faith. It's not a generic faith. We are a people who have attached ourselves to the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so all of the energy, all of the power, all of the speed and the momentum of the church is found in that we are attached to Christ. That we are in Him, that we have faith in something way greater than ourselves. We can see this in the book of Hebrews, which we've been studying through. We haven't gotten there yet, but likely the most well-known statement on faith in the entire Bible comes out of Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. In that context, it's not a generic faith we zoom back out into the book of Hebrews, what, what we are talking about is faith in the superiority of Christ. If we look just more specifically in the immediate context of chapter 11, right before that we have faith in Christ's single sacrifice, chapter 10, verse 11. We have faith in our access to God through Christ, chapter 10, verse 19. We have faith in the second coming of Christ, chapter 9, verse 28. We have faith in the hope of an eternal future, chapter 10, verse 36. So yes, we are a people of faith, but not just generically. We are a people of faith in Christ. Point number two. That is faith in what? And it is in Jesus. Motivation for what? This is a unique morning for us as a ministry. We'll talk later on about future plans and buildings and things like that. But it's important for us to ground that big picture conversation in our big picture purpose. We did this together at the beginning of this year, walking through as a church what we just described as mission, vision, and values, and I'll, I'll cut to the punchline, right, because I have that less than 10-minute sermon. We gather together to worship and hear the Word of God to glorify God in all things. That's why we exist. 
why we're here. I could take you to Isaiah 43 and show you that that is the very purpose for which you are made. I could take you to that great benediction in Ephesians chapter 3. That we, we pray these things to the glory of God. Or Philippians chapter 1, that it is all for the glory of God. Or the end of the great uh, hymn in Philippians 2, verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted Him, Jesus, and bestowed on Him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So our faith is in Christ and our motivation is the glory of God. We try to do things in this ministry that are always only aimed at God's glory. That's why we exist. It is our singular target, our guiding motivation for what we do. Faith in Christ, we work for God to His glory. That's why we're here, church. That's why we're going to talk about buildings. It's why we try to, to, to preach the Word. It's why we do everything. Every choice is downstream from that end goal. So let me end framing this morning and our ministry with what I gave to you that first Sunday. Uh, we closed that sermon thinking about mission, vision, and values. It was the first Sunday in January, and these are the closing words from that morning. Be it resolved, we do not exist to make the name of Headwaters great. What drives this church is not highly polished programs or membership numbers or buildings, or winning the culture, or social justice, or taking money, or any other errant reason churches have lost sight of the primary goal in the past. All we do is done to bring God glory. We are caught up in an eternal purpose with eternal value. We exist for the glory of the great God of the universe, the creator and sustainer, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. We exist for God's glory. And if God would be glorified by headwaters being brought low, then we will joyously be brought down as far as needed. And if God is glorified by the continued growth of this congregation, then we will gladly praise His name as He works to do what only He can do. We will press on to proclaim the gospel and teach the Bible in order to make and grow disciples of Jesus Christ for God's glory. This is who we are, and this is why we exist. Thanks for gathering together this morning. I hope that is the heartbeat of your life. It is the heartbeat of this ministry. Would you stand together and sing to that great purpose?
Well, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. I was sitting there reflecting. Um, when you get older, you kind of look back a lot. And uh, when we came in December of 1987, there were 30 people uh, in our church. And I was sitting there, how in the world did we get here? Um, I mean, it is embarrassing that after that amazing song, this is the guy up here talking. It, my, my life's ministry verse is Numbers twenty two twenty eight, which says, the Lord opened the mouth of a donkey. <laughs> that makes sense to me. I get that. And uh, as I was sitting there next to AIM, just thinking about the last 36 years, um, we tried to be faithful when there were 30. And then there were 60, and we tried to be faithful when there were 60, and when there were 60... Uh, came a hundred, and we tried to be a faithful in their hundred, and and it was like this, you know, this parable. If you, the, the guy who's given five talents added, and the guy who's given ten added, and the guy who gets, so, it, and now we're sitting here today, and the room's got twelve hundred people in it, and we're like, how did we get here? And even the more important question is, what does faithfulness look like with twelve hundred? Right? I I know what it looks like with thirty. I did thirty. I've never done 1,200, and so this morning we're going to lay out what we think 
faithfulness looks like with 1,200 people. Now, before we do that, though, um, we need to open our Bibles and spend a little time in the Scriptures, and that's what we do at Headwaters. I'm glad you brought yours, whether it's electronic or paper. I'm a paper guy, personally, but uh, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> Psalm 67 will be our passage today. And as we understand our Christian faith from the scriptures, there's an interesting paradox that becomes apparent, and it is this. Christianity is very exclusive in nature. Um, Think about that. We call each other brothers and sisters. Uh, We talk about us, us and them. When Jesus taught us to pray, he said what? Our Father, and the Bible references us as God's children, born of him. That's a very exclusive approach to life. It doesn't make us better, it just sets us apart. But while we are extremely exclusive, we are called to be totally inclusive. But what I mean by that is, While we are this family of faith, we are to invite others to join us. And the family doesn't become any less sweet because more people join it. You don't become any less cherished by God because there are more of you. And so we have this very interesting dilemma on our hands where we develop exclusivity But while we're developing exclusivity, we roll out the carpet of inclusivity. No prejudice. We invite everyone, right? Poor, rich, black, white, male, female. That's all there is, by the way. I just thought I'd pass that one on to you. (laughs) If you're waiting for the next 17, I only have two, and I. (laughs) So, in an attempt to be faithful, in an attempt to understand that God has made us dear to him, at the same time, he has called us to show that dearness to others who don't know it yet. That's our challenge. Um, five and a half years ago, we sat in this very room and we dared to believe that a suburban church could move to an urban location and make a difference. We took a swing at it. It wasn't a small swing, was it? We did that because the people in our church's heart was so full of what you were just singing about that we dared to believe that that heart would get out of the way of all the social constructs and say, we're going to go love our neighbors like we've never loved them before. And so we moved to Well Street, and uh, we've been working at it ever since. When we made that move, we had a kind of a theme for it called Amplify. The idea is we wanted to make God's name loud. We, we wanted to do what we were just singing. You got loud, by the way. That was fun, wasn't it? And out of that loudness of him, we wanted to make a difference in our city. We moved to Well Street, and uh, as we were raising funds and volunteering 70,000 hours and all the amazing things that have happened uh, over that time, we started to at least squeak his name out in the neighborhood. Here we are, you know, and uh, I don't know that we've made it as loud yet as we plan on making it, but the journey began. We got to Wells and all of a sudden a bunch of new people came and if you've come in the last five years, welcome to the journey with us who've been here through the whole thing. And, and then we rolled out a new theme called Share Squared. And Share Squared was this concept. Because of what we share, the exclusivity, we share the inclusivity. 
And both of those were attached with fundraising and such. And so I uh, wanted to tell you today that we're going to roll back to Amplify. It's 2.0, okay? I didn't, have, uh, I didn't have anything better to say about that. It's not Amplify squared. It's Amplify 2.0. And these next steps that we're going to take, we're going to lay out some things for you today, as Luke said, some construction stuff, philosophy and ministry, and so on. But these next steps are to do two things. Maximize exclusivity while we trumpet inclusivity. Psalm 67 is our theme passage of Scripture. And I'd like you to stand, and I want to read it to you this morning. That was fun to hear. I just want you to know. All those little chairs went whoop, right? We're going to have some whomping chairs in the new building. Anyhow, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that your way may be known on the earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase, God. Our God shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Let's pray. It is, Father, so appropriate to bow before you, to think of the fact that you are the great I am, and yet you invite us to call you Father that you have sought our hearts and filled them with something we could not even imagine. You have amplified yourself in us, and we beg you for the courage to amplify you to our city. It takes courage, Father, because they don't want to hear about you, and it causes us to be afraid. So we beg you for courage, We beg you for perseverance. We beg you for unity in this church so that your great name will be shown to anyone and everyone. We long for your hand to be on our church. We don't even know where you're going to take us. But if you're behind it, Father... We want to go there. I thank you for the courage of this church family five years ago to step away from the comfort of what was known to something that was complete mystery. Give us the courage to do it again as we make your name great to our city. Thank you for this psalm. Help us to enjoy its truths now. Amen. Please be seated. Psalm 67 begins with us. Exclusivity. It begins with a prayer. God, be gracious to us. God, bless us. God, make your face shine upon us. There's a place for the family of faith, isn't there? We need our God to be amplified first in us. Think about even just the phrase where he says, make your face shine upon us. It is a bold request for his presence his favor, his direction, his purpose. I could go on and on. There aren't enough words. It is a repetition of the Aaronic priestly blessing that God gave 
of the priests in Numbers chapter 6. In Numbers chapter 6, verse 22, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. Think of that prayer. God, make your face shine upon us. That is a request for his grace. It is a request for his peace. It is an understanding that we can do nothing without his face on us. As a matter of fact, uh, in the Bible, when God hides his face, the people are separated from him. Isaiah 59, 2 our iniquities have separated us from him and has hidden his face from us. I'll tell you what, you guys. We start this morning in this room, and our prayer is, God, would you be gracious to us as we move forward? Would, would you bless us and make your face shine upon our church? We're crying out to you because we want you before anything else. And so before proclamation comes passion. And the question we should ask ourselves, are we satisfied with God himself enough? Psalm 67, before it ever thinks about the nations, thinks about themselves. We're going to show you a rendering of a sanctuary in just a moment. It is really a statement to say we want God to be loud in us we we want a place where we can go rest ourselves and hear his voice and be inspired by his greatness and have him pull us along to say come on you can even do greater things By the time the psalm ends in verse 6 and 7, the request becomes a statement of assurance. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. And so I want to suggest to you guys first that we need to keep developing our own souls. We need to keep enlarging our own hearts. We need to keep touching the hand of our Heavenly Father and let Him place in us a passion that no one can put out. You understand our culture, our society is not exactly big fans of us. Right? It's going to get worse. Our strength is going to need to be greater. And so first, foremost, exclusively we touch the heart of our heavenly father and he touches our hearts and he is amplified within us he is made loud he is made great inside of us following that request is a, 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 a twist that I really wouldn't have expected and that is once God shines his face on us we then take that shining face and display it to the people's so verse 2, that your way may be known in all the earth, that your saving power among all the nations. So the exclusivity of God in us turns quickly to inclusivity for anyone who would believe. We do not care what that new person looks like. We are no respecters of men because God is no respecters of men. And since he has put in us his soul, then we live and breathe and move with that very soul. And so when he is amplified in us, he will be amplified from us. Look at verse 2. That your way may be known. Because he's amplified in us, his ways are known on the earth. Your saving power among the nations, because he's amplified in us, He's amplified from us, and people now know 
who he is, what he does, and how much power he has. That's the purpose of our campus. That's the purpose of our church, to take what he has done in us and let it be known to the people around us. It causes verse 3 to happen. All the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. And it means this, that new people become what? One of us. You see, we cannot be satisfied with where we are. We must always push the envelope to bring his great name to those around us. And the family grows. And we go, unbelievable, how did we get here? Well, we were faithful with 30, and then there were 60, and then there was 100, and then there was 200, and, and then I don't know what happened. I got confused and really tired along the way. Verse 4, the nations will be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the people with equity. You guide the nations upon the earth. We hear a lot of talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, don't we, in our society. It is a fool's errand to think we're ever going to get that from humanity. It's not going to happen. We cannot overcome our racial instincts. We cannot overcome the prejudices we have towards people. They just instinctively live in us. We don't have to work at it very hard. You could see someone on the street and you instantly prejudge them. That's your prejudice happening. But when you put Christ in your soul and you amplify him in your heart, you have a different view of the people on the street. And you'll notice that those peoples who long to have fairness will find it in the judge in heaven. And once you understand that on earth I am not going to get this, but by my heavenly Father I have it every day, my heart can live with that. Man will keep abusing man because that's what man does. I mean, the first two brothers didn't get along real well. Sibling rivalry ended in murder. But God, right, who was rich in mercy and loved us, fills us with grace that we marvel at how could a lying, murdering, evil person now be so kind that was a guy named Saul in the book of Acts and the inclusive Christian folks said I don't trust this guy he keeps throwing people in jail and killing our our friends and family but God had transformed him and he became part of us and so then in verse 5, the peoples will praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. And verse 7 ends up with, God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. They acknowledge their creator. They understand that he is the greatest thing that they could ever experience. So think about it. God is amplified in us exclusively that causes us to amplify him inclusively of anyone who would join us. When they join us, we gather together in the great chorus of praise for him, and he is amplified in us and amplified from us. They now acknowledge their creator and fear him. They now rest in the fact that he will bless them, and they join us in praying, verse 1. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. This is the task that God has left for his church on this earth. And if you don't mind me being very specific, this is the task that he left for headwaters to perform for as long as we're on this earth. We are to do this. We are to make his name great. 
because it's great inside of us. And flowing out of the greatness that reigns in our heart, we say to our community, behold our God. Stand and let's sing that awesome song.
So if you'll give us a second, got to rearrange some furniture, and uh, we want to present to you what we think's next. What does faithfulness look like with 1,200 people? We're not perfect on this. We might be wrong. We've been wrong lots of times. Five and a half years One ago, more. when I stood on this stage and said, what do you guys think? Would it make any sense to move to a campus on Wells Street? Um, the critics lined up pretty hard. I was called a used car salesman. Uh, I was called all kinds of things by people from within. It hadn't even gotten to the people from without. I met them a couple weeks later. That was a lot of fun, too. Um, I can assure you this. We don't desire to do anything that God doesn't want us to do. And we're doing our very, very best to discern his grace in our lives and what the direction of our church is. And uh, we're going to share with you some of those plans. And yes, it requires finances. And yes, it requires bulldozers and all kinds of weird stuff. But uh, we think it sets him up to be amplified in us and from us. And so we want to present that to you. So yeah, we're going to cover this, what has been done, and then what's next. And then how are we getting there? and how you can help. Steve? Okay, so what has been done? So September 2018, like John had said, we sat in this very room five and a half years ago and talked about the possibility of relocating. We had some conversations behind the scene. John, John said, I think we could do the first service at Easter. Um, John, what year were you thinking <laughs> Easter of what? Easter 2019. You know, we, we tasted that the Lord was good this morning. We saw that we have, his face has shined upon us. And there is some benefit to looking back in history. We certainly want to look forward. We're going to do a lot of that. But there is some value here, I think, in seeing how good the Lord has been to us. There are some photos, some before and after. We had, as John had said, 70,000 hours put in by volunteers. Here's a few photos of before and after uh, the chapel. Uh, we had uh, Building 2, the kids' gym. I know, I know, it's great. My favorite's coming up. My favorite is coming up. <laughs> Kids Hall. So many of you did so much of this work. Just so, so good. Chapel parking. The pool. <laughs> and a lot of us thought we had finally gone off, off the deep end, but obviously we didn't because it was filled with chairs and tables and things. So April 2021, we had that little pesky COVID thing that got in our way, right? You remember that? And uh, we were one church in two locations for a while. And then we came together then, in April 2021. Uh, of course, a lot of metrics could be applied to this, but one would be numerical growth. Uh, in 2020, we were averaging about 700, and as of last month, we were averaging about 1,100. So the Lord certainly has been very, very good to us. I'm going to hand this off to Luke. Luke's going to take over. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to step to the side so I can see over here and talk to you at the same time. So I, I think it's, it's worth mentioning that all of this is done in light of, of Proverbs 21, 31, which says, prepare the horse for the battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. We're going to work as hard as we possibly can and rest in God through the whole thing. All right. So this, all of the work and the effort and the uh, presenting things is not a look what we can do apart from God. It is, we are going to work as hard as we possibly can knowing that God holds all the cards and we are downstream from that. So that is where we are. I get to talk about what's next, what's coming. I don't know if you've noticed, 
but when we gather to worship, we're in a gymnasium. Now, some of you actually have not noticed that, believe it or not. There have been people who are like, no, that's great. I don't know what you're talking about. And uh, there are a lot of limitations that come with that. I, let me just point a few out to you before I get to what's coming next. There aren't many restrooms, and they aren't nearby. Now, believe it or not, that's been prohibitive, prohibitive from some people coming at all. That's hard. It's sad for our church family, particularly some of our elderly congregants. Like, it's too far away. I, I, I can't do that. I can't get it. The, the building's too hard to navigate. It's just too hard. That we don't want a building that's too difficult for somebody to be able to come and gather with their church. So that's, that's an issue. Second, we, we have two great gymnasiums, but we really only have one because one of them's set up for church all the time. and We don't get to use it for just about anything except church on Sunday morning. It's limited to that. Third, and probably maybe most significant, that room is not set up to hear well. Okay, so you do know. All right. I, yeah, yeah. yeah, that knowing chuckle through the room. Uh, it, it, it's a square box with hard surfaces in all directions. It's getting painted right now. It will look a little prettier when we come back, but it's still going to sound about the same. There's just not much you can do for a square box. And so... As a church family, when we gather, it, you guys are great. I just want to say before I keep going, the, the willingness and flexibility of the congregation has been incredibly encouraging. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try to make it better and more accessible and a, a better environment for everybody involved. So we're looking at building a sanctuary. Oh, one more thing. We're out of room. Yeah, let's just add to that, right? There's not room in the parking lot. There's really not room in the sanctuary. I was talking backstage just a moment ago with Hunter Totemeyer. He said, if we get to 2,000, he said, if you close the doors right now, we'll get to 2,000 just by the birth rate alone. I was like, well, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. All right? So we take that be fruitful and multiply thing very seriously around here. There's lots of children. Praise be to God for that, right? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they didn't tell you. <laughs> They didn't tell you all that numerical growth was just kids. It's just, just a bunch of little people running around. Um, so the way that we do ministry, we have to grow three things at the same ratio together. And that is seats in the sanctuary with classrooms and with parking. Right now, classrooms we have a little bit of margin on and we have more uh, flexibility without buildings and other things to be able to keep going without massive changes. But in parking in sanctuary, we are out of space. And, and we need to do something to be able to grow and to make a better environment. So I get the great joy of showing some of that to you. I'm going to show you a quick rendering, a walkthrough video. We'll look at some stills that come from that rendering in just a minute, and I'll talk you through uh, what's going on there. By the way, everything that I'm going to share with you, you're going to get on your way out, right? There's one of these things. It opens up. It has a lot of the pictures you're about to see. So if you miss something, it's there. But if I give it to you now, you won't listen to a word I say. So you have to wait. <laughs> You have to wait until we walk out the door. All right, what's next? Oh, hey, we're going to be building a sanctuary. Here we go. Maybe. So to orient you, this is in the second floor. Through those three doors right there is the kids' check-in. To the left is the chapel. This is the middle section of our building. Right now we have two separate sides of our building that really feel disconnected. They need to be connected in many ways for things to make sense. There's a big wall in between those two pillars right there. If that wall were gone, there is a old foyer, uh, racquetball spaces to the right. That's going to become a kitchen. We will we'll see a still of that in just a moment. You won't go into this rendering. You're going to pass through a coffee shop on your left, go straight through into the sanctuary. I'll give you some more details on that again in just a moment when I get to some of the still shots. Walking forward, one of the things, again, you won't see on the renderings or the stills is through that back door, the three back doors there is a back of house, uh, storage, restrooms for, if you've ever done baptisms, oh yeah, there's a baptismal in that stage. If you've been baptized in our current situation, it's not great. You've got to walk up a long hallway, dripping wet, and then the bathroom, it's not a great situation. We know that. Back up through the sanctuary. This guy's on his phone. He's not paying attention. <laughs> That wasn't the Bible app. I know it. All right. Turn back around. This is called raked seating. And this exits back out into that kind of corridor walkway that's above the foyer. If you go out here and turn to your right, you'd go to the third floor ABF rooms. But you're up above that foyer you just came in at. 
down the stairs right below you would take you down to the gyms where we currently worship. If you were to go all the way around, kind of make a big spiral down to the end. All right, so that is the, the walkthrough. Some of you, if you've been around here for a while, you've seen a, an older version of that. If you're newer, you may not have seen that at all. So that'll be posted on our website at some point. You'll be able to look at that again. We'll have a bunch more information on that. Let me walk you through very quickly. This is that trifold that I just showed you. This is that center page. So you'll get the more detailed things. If you can't read everything, don't worry. I'll hand it to you on your way out the door. Let me show you a couple of things here. So this is a view of the sanctuary. That seats at its max. We have about 1,000 seats in that room. Right now, we're uh, just around 600 in our room currently. The way that our ratios work, that means we're about, this room would support a church of around 2,000, maybe a little hi uh, higher than that. So we're going to see one more from the other direction. A couple clicks here. This is from the stage looking out. So that gives you the sanctuary view from that. That stage is about twice the size of the one that we currently have set up in the gym, although we added to that recently. Twice the size of the one that was set up in the gym not too long ago. So that's the sanctuary. Oh boy, ah, I just held something. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I actually don't think I held anything. I think that button is stuck. I don't know what to do. <laughs> just wait for one moment. I think that button is stuck. So if you wanna, it's back, okay. Why don't you click? I don't know. Well, I'll try it again. Let's go one forward, one more forward. I did so good with my 10 minutes earlier. I'm already past my time right now. Okay, um, so this is uh, the, the kitchen. I don't know if you know this. We, there's no kitchen in our whole facility. That seems absurd, right? We have a few like warming kitchens, but nowhere that you can actually prepare food. They're really like galley kitchens. This is a commercial grade kitchen. It's it's much larger than that rendering even makes it look. If you go step in those racquetball rooms right now, you go, oh, that's, that's going to be a big space. There's room for lots of people in there. Uh, church folk like food. I don't know if you know that. This is a good thing. So that is a, a massive need. Let's go back with all kinds of care. All right. Now we're going to go back to the foyer. So as I mentioned earlier, we kind of have two parts of our building that aren't really connected. There's this center section that feels like what's happening, right? It's not heated or cooled. You just like walk through it and you go, what's, what's going on in here? This is that space. It needs love and it needs uh, to be a, if, if we get it done, it will become an understandable building like that. Like right, right overnight, you walk into that space and you can go, oh yeah, kids are here, adults are there, youth are there, restrooms, I point Back that uh, lower brick hallway there, I don't have a rendering of it, but you don't need to see the inside of a restroom, do you? You know what those look like. It, there's, there's a couple new restrooms there that are larger than any that we have right down that hallway. It helps with, with that pinch as well. One more of the foyer. So this is looking from uh, about where the chapel doors are back toward the coffee shop and the sanctuary. So that's the space. You see that brick wall, the old facade of the, the original 1931 building. Um, anything that I missed, I think I hit most of it. Do I have anything else I need to say to anybody? You, uh, I'm about to hand it off to other people. So if I missed anything that you think, it, this will help us immensely. It's needed, and I gave you a bunch of different reasons. We're out of space. There's limitations to the space in which we're in right now. And uh, really grateful for the opportunity and for God's blessing. If God continues to bless, we very much so expect so. And we continue to, to be faithful with what he's given us. Troy, who's up? I don't want to touch that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Those things don't work for me on a really good day when the wind's blowing in the right direction. So, Chad, I'm going to just lean on you, okay? So let's go to the first slide here. There are three elements. Luke, I think, mentioned it earlier that if if we want to facilitate numerical growth, we have to have sanctuary space, adequate parking, and classrooms. Those three have to grow together for our church to continue to blossom, if you will. So this is a uh, bird's eye view of our campus. Well Street would be at the bottom of the screen. Um, there are the five buildings out front, the main building that we're in, where it says Headwaters Church. Those are the gymnasiums that we meet in on Sunday. Uh, the light blue area is added parking that's coming with this development as well. 
Uh, we currently have about 420 parking spaces. We routinely park 85 to 90 percent every Sunday. That's just normal. Um, so we're going to add about at least maybe around 100 more spaces. We'll be over 500 spaces. And we do have some future parking uh, beyond this if the church continues to grow. We, it's already mapped out. It's already planned for and ready to go. Next one, Chad. Uh, the, the top picture on the left, if you've never been there, uh, that's what the swimming pool looks like from the outside. It is all kinds of ugly. And um, we don't know why they chose that color brick. It's the only place on campus that's there, and it's falling off the building, unfortunately. So the bottom right is a rendering of what it will become. Uh, there'll be an addition on the back side as well as a complete resurfacing of the building. And then if you'll notice the ramp there, there'll be a new entrance that you'll be able to come in from the east side, uh, kind of science central side of the building. So the parking that will come out there, they'll have a way to get in the building there, direct into the, there'll be another little foyer for the sanctuary there. Wanted you to see that. Uh, next one, please. Um, this is a, again, overview, and these are our ministry partners. When, we talked, when I talked about Amplify a minute ago, I talked about exclusivity and inclusivity, and the exclusivity, again, uh, was it great singing Behold Our God just a minute ago? It was kind of good, wasn't it? Um, but you get those moments sometimes where you're like, I don't want to leave church, which hopefully cancels all the times that said, I don't want to go to church, you know, we get that. Um, but repurposing the swimming pool also allows us to expand our campus and uh, go after these ministries. These are uh, ministries that exist. Classical Roots Christian School is already a partner of ours. They meet two days a week, um, and they're doing an amazing job. So and serves already on campus. The crossing's supposed to come in uh, June. New Mercies Ministry, they are actively fundraising so they can remodel Building 3. Um, and then Building 5, uh, the Community Christian Healthcare, also raising funds to put a clinic, dental clinic, as well as medical clinic on our campus that will be free to anybody who wants to use it. We've now had to tag Building 4 to say future classroom expansion. Uh, I think Luke mentioned all the littles that are showing up. Um, by the way, when you guys clapped for the people who are making the babies, it was only the old people clapping. I don't know if any of <laughs> The young people are... The ones who are raising the littles are like dragging, and the old people are going, yeah, you go, have 10. Yeah, it'll be great. <laughs> Anyhow, the kids are coming for us, and they keep, they're already bleeding up on the third floor both on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. They're going to take over the joint, and that's great. We'll move the adults out into Building 4, and it'll be, it'll be good, you guys. It'll be okay. So we, we had all kinds of plans for Building 4, and none of them worked. And so the Lord evidently knew what we didn't know. So that's a little bit overview of what's coming. This sets us up, again, to pursue our hearts in worship. Yes, it's great, but it frees our campus up, too, for the inclusivity. Let's, let's make God loud in our neighborhood. And so that's what we have to do. Troy's going to come and share how that's going to happen. Once I get my screen live. Okay, let's, uh, we've done a little flyover, the, looked at the renderings. John kind of gave an overview, sort of looked inside the church, uh, looked at outside the church, what uh, we are seeing God do on the campus and, and look forward to him continuing to do on the campus. So the project that you've just seen uh, in total is estimated around seven and a half million dollars. That's the sanctuary, center spine, back of house, entrance that John referenced on the east side, and uh, also all the parking around to make, to make all that work and function. So we have, through your generosity, the, the Lord's given us at this point a net right now of $2 million that we have to invest as of right now today in this project. Uh, again, that's the Amplify, Share Squared, now Amplify again funds uh, that you've all given. So the gap, $5.5 that's uh, between us raising more money 
and bank debt. And uh, so that's how we're going to cover the gap. Our desire is to raise as much as possible. So we'll talk about that a little more as we go here in the next few minutes. Uh, the less we, uh, the more we raise, the less we borrow. And uh, we'd like to borrow as little as possible. But several banks have committed to us. We have commitments anywhere from $4 million to $5 million uh, of commitments. And so as we look at those commitments, we look internally at uh, a covenant that we keep in, uh, we use internally to help keep ourselves in check. And we like no more than 20% of our annual budget to go toward debt service. If you do the math on the current budget, uh, if you have $4.5 million, and we'd like to be no more than $4.5 million on the debt side, our current budget would put us at about 19% of our budget allocated to debt service. So it keeps us within that covenant that we use internally. We would like to raise at least a million dollars over the next 12 months. So that's the goal and objective. John's going to talk about that a little more. Uh, with that, we do have several paths that we can look at, alternatives, different parts of the project that can be deferred till later down the road to allow us to fit Again, we're trying to, we want to live within this internal covenant on the debt side, and we would like to uh, raise as much as possible as we go into the project. A couple of dates for you to keep in mind here coming up. We have uh, next Sunday evening in the chapel, we're going to be doing a, a renovation Q&A. Uh, this is just a real overview, and I know there are plenty of people in this room that have more detailed questions. So we'll be there to answer questions, go through things in more detail next Sunday evening. And then the following Sunday will be a business meeting after church. It's April 28th, following church, so approximately 1230. We'll do a business meeting, walk through, and there will be a, a vote for the members on taking on the debt. All right, so John's going to kind of close this out here as we continue our way down this path to funding the project. Again, uh, five years ago when we did this, a um, lot of accusations. You're gonna, you're gonna run the church into the ground. You're gonna bankrupt the place. You'll never be up. Listen, you guys, I've given my whole life to this place. I'm the last guy that wants to bankrupt this place. I can guarantee you that. And so, if we don't have the money, we don't do it. It's just, it's not that hard to figure out. Having said that, we're there. So, how can you help? I'm gonna show a couple slides here, and tell you a couple stories. So you saw this slide earlier, but if you look in the back, you see that little blue box at the top of the screen. Remember uh, Luke said there are no restrooms for the gymnasiums? We're about to build some restrooms for the gymnasiums and a little concession stand. This sets the gymnasiums up to do ministry. This project's about $200,000. And here's what's amazing. One family in our church said, we will do it. So they're, they're fam a family taking on that project, paying for the whole thing. That's why we're not even including it in the $7.5 because they've already said, we want to be a part of this. We believe in what the church is doing. We want these gymnasiums functioning in the community. Uh, we had the uh, CEO of Greater Fort Wayne in this week uh, and walked him through the facility and said, here's what we're trying to do and so on. So uh, that will be an amazing tool, right? That's a really cool thing. So th that's, that project is covered. There's a, a beautiful rendering of it right there. Little stick drawing thing. That's all we have. So I thought I'd show you what we have. But uh, it's a little gabled deal. And uh, you'll be able to enter then from where that gravel parking lot. That'll become the main entrance to the gyms. We will then be able to drop a gate across the ramp and isolate our gymnasiums so that they can be used more. Right now... If we open them up, they can get anywhere in the building. It just, it's not safe for kids. Kids are curious. If I was a kid, I'd want to be in the tunnels. If I was in the tunnels, I'd want to be in the dirt spaces. If I was in the dirt spaces, I'd want to knock a hole in the wall, figure out, and light a fire or something. One of the things that I would do if I was a kid. Uh, next slide, please, Chad. Uh, second announcement today. A second family in our church said, we really believe in this project. We're going to donate $200,000 to get started, and we'd like to challenge our church family to match that gift. Um, and so what we're trying to announce today is this. We'd like to raise that 200000 in the month of May, and by the end of the month of May, match that gift. We've got 400000 of the million. We're ready to go, you guys. 
okay? Because there's two ways to attack a project. You can raise money, you can shrink budget. There are things that we can do that will make this thing happen. So I wanted to tell you what you could be involved in. Listen, 70,000 volunteer hours is still an unbelievable story. This is not that. This isn't about coming and painting and chipping away old stuff. There's a 33-ton beam that has to be lifted up. We're not going to put it on our shoulders and climb ladders and put it in place. You got the idea? So we have to let the professionals do their thing, and that's okay. What we can do, though, the same way we pitched in with 70,000 volunteer hours, we can pitch in and help financially. And I don't want you to feel like any gift is too small. Well, I can't give very... You want to be a part of this, you guys. This is what our church is doing. We're going to take that amplified God in our heart. We're going to make him loud in our community. And this is the next step for that to take place. And so we're excited about that. We think it's an amazing opportunity. I don't know what's going to happen. I didn't know what was going to happen when there were 30 people. I never thought there'd be 60. When 60 showed up, I went to Amy. I remember going home. There were 66 people. I said, now we're talking. We're really cooking now. (laughs) I'm not kidding you. And so I don't know what's next. But I know God's asking us to not just sit on what we've already done, but be bold for his name's sake because he's great and he deserves his name to be made loud. And we think this is the next step to doing that. I hope you'll pray about it. I hope you'll participate in it. You can give to Amplify now. We're back to Amplify. We can give to Amplify anytime you want and designate your gifts and it'll go to this project 100% and uh, we'll get this thing done. And then when we get it done, we're just getting started. That's not the end. That's the other thing you have to understand. When we get all this done, now we start, okay? And uh, we're making God's name great in our community. I hope you'll participate in it. Thanks so much for being here today. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious Lord, we have lifted our voices in song to you this morning proclaiming you to be great and to be good. And you alone are worthy of our praise. What an amazing blessing it is, Lord, to call you Father and to live under your watch, watchful eye each day. And so we praise your holy name. Father, we ask you for forgiveness for those times in which we sin and we fail to live up to the high calling of your children and disciples of your son, Jesus. And we pray that you would have mercy on us, Lord, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are so undeserving, and yet we marvel at the things that you have done in our midst over the last several years. You have opened up the windows of heaven and poured out financial blessings. You have provided time and energy for many of our people to donate thousands of hours in contributed labor. And Father, we know that all of this abundance comes from your gracious hand. And we are so, so very grateful. We also thank you, Lord, for calling us to a work that demands our best efforts and then leads us to total dependence solely upon you. And so, Father, as we seek to expand our abilities to work for your kingdom here at home and abroad and to build a sanctuary where we can gather together to meet and to praise and worship you in spirit and in truth, Father, we ask that you would continue to provide and that you would give us wisdom as we use the resources that you are giving. And that we do this all in order to make and grow disciples all to the praise of your glorious name. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus, amen. Uh, Let me pray. 
Father God, uh, it is so good to be in your presence this morning, uh, to behold you. Father, we stand in awe of your excellencies. Uh, we are amazed at what you have done. We thank you for calling us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. Uh, we thank you for how you have worked in this church. We thank you for how uh, you are working in our city. We thank you for how you're working at Harvest and, and blessing them and working in the hearts and lives there. And, um, we just thank you for their partnership. Father, I pray uh, that you would work in us and through us. I pray that you would use our campus as an instrument to uh, proclaim your name loudly. I pray that you would give us wisdom, help us to use our finances as a tool uh, to uh, be able to proclaim your name effectively. Father, I pray that you would use us, use our lives as a poet uses a pen to declare the greatness of your name uh, to our, our friends and neighbors and to our city. Father, I just pray that you would continue to do uh, the work in us and through us that you have begun. Amen. Hello, there you go, thank you. Um, I improvised right there, that wasn't their fault. That was my fault. Uh, have you enjoyed the music today? It's been great, right? <laughs> Special thanks to these guys. We think we should rise to our feet. We're gonna sing one last time together. So bust it out, blow the roof off this place. When we're done singing, you're dismissed. Thanks so much for being a part of church this morning.
out to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.